Welcome to this session of New Start for the Family. The N stands for nutrition. And of course, we only have a few minutes to discuss this topic, so we really have to get to the essentials. What are the primary attributes of a good nutrition program? The first one is eating foods high in antioxidants. Eating foods high in what? Antioxidants. There are a number of advantages of antioxidants. It prevents damage to the arteries. Uh, if you, the problem primarily is oxidized cholesterol and other oxidized products that start those blockages in the arteries. And the antioxidants uh, can in many respects protect those arteries. They scavenge free radicals, they prevent or actually can help treat cancer. They help the immune system fight off infections. Uh, pretty clear, and it also slows down the aging process. So you live longer, and you live far happier, and you look better when you eat foods high in antioxidants. Now, the Human Nutrition Center in Beltsville, along with the University of Arkansas, recently looked at plant foods to take a look at the power of them as far as their antioxidant potential. One of the things they found out is whole plant foods exceed that of their component parts. In other words, a cup of cooked kale has 50 milligrams of vitamin C and 13 units of vitamin E. Are those vitamins important? They're actually antioxidant vitamins, powerful antioxidants. But if you take a look at the antioxidant potential of that one cup of kale, it's equal to 800 milligrams of vitamin C and 1,100 units of vitamin E. That's powerful, far more powerful in foods than what you get in supplements. And so they took a look at fruits, and they took a look at vegetables, and they ranked them. In fact, they ranked them all the way down to 20, but we're going to look at the top 10. Number 10, grapefruit. Uh, very potent antioxidant fruit. Number nine, Kiwi, number eight, cherries, number seven, grapes, number six, oranges. And you know, some people think eating healthfully is somehow not tasty. How can you say any of those uh, fruits, uh, when you see them, are not appetizing and tasty? Number five, plums. Plums are a very humble fruit, but loaded as far as the antioxidant potential. Number four, raspberries. Number three, strawberries. Anyone want to guess what's in the top two? Number two is blackberries. Uh, and number one, blueberries, the top antioxidant fruit. They also took a look at the top antioxidant vegetables. And now they didn't look at legumes as part of this. They lumped those into a little separate category. But number 10 is eggplant. Number nine, corn. Number eight, onion. Seven, red bell pepper. Six, beets. Five, broccoli. Four, Brussels sprouts. Anyone want to guess what's in the top three? Number three is spinach, a very potent antioxidant vegetable. Number two is kale, even higher than spinach. And the top antioxidant vegetable is indeed garlic, one of the advantages of being married to a Romanian uh, like I am. Every entree starts out with four cloves of garlic. And then there are some spices that are also loaded with antioxidants. Rosehip is number 10. Uh, a kaya uh, fruit, uh, the pulp or skin powder is number nine, sage is eight, turmeric seven, thyme six, rosemary five, oregano four, sorghum is number three, cloves number two, and sumac bran is actually a spice that is the top antioxidant spice. And of course these spices can enhance the flavors. And then they took a look at the antioxidant potential of fruits, vegetables, and legumes combined. So you can get an idea. These are we ones that would 
kind of uh, be at the top of the list uh, of, of all of the categories, but black beans is number 10, pecans, number 9, apple, 8, blackberries, 7, artichokes, 6, cranberries, 5, pinto beans, 4, kidney beans, 3, blueberries, number 2, and the top in their list were the small red beans called adzuka beans. And uh, they didn't test soy uh, in this. I'm a little disappointed because uh, I think the soybeans would have come out uh, very close to the top if not at the top. And so principle number one, eat foods regularly high in antioxidants. Now before we get to principle number two, it's important to understand the circulation is critical for good health. Nutrient delivery and cell nutrition as well as waste removal must have adequate circulation. And it's crucial for adequate athletic performance and crucial for, ath for mental performance as well. Our brain has to have a good circulation. When circulation stops, death obviously occurs. And our circulation is dependent on two primary outcomes. One, no blockages. In other words, no cholesterol plaque accumulation, keeping the blood vessels clean and free from obstruction. And secondly, the ability to keep your arteries not constricted. You know, the, the arteries are a muscular organ. They can actually constrict down and they can dilate and get bigger. And we depend on the capacity of those lining cells called the endothelial cells that comprises the single layer lining of our arteries to manufacture a substance called nitric oxide that causes those arteries to dilate and allow a lot more flow. So principle number two is avoid disease producing foods. In other words, avoid foods that are going to build up those blockages and constrict those vessels. And it stands to reason that cholesterol is one of those primary foods that causes blockages. Now, we just mentioned those antioxidant foods, the fruits, vegetables, grains, and nuts. How much cholesterol are, is in those foods? You're right, actually zero. If you want to know whether a food has cholesterol in it, find out if it's a plant or an animal. If it's a plant, it has no cholesterol. If it's an animal or it comes from an animal, it's going to have some cholesterol in it. Even skim milk has four to five milligrams of cholesterol. 2% milk, 18 milligrams of cholesterol. Whole milk, 33 milligrams of cholesterol. Egg white is the only exception. It doesn't have cholesterol. Mayonnaise, eight milligrams. This is where a lot of people start getting confused. I know a lot of people who think tuna is part of the plant kingdom and has no <laughs> cholesterol. But in reality, it actually is an animal. Uh, fish is not a plant, it does have cholesterol, and studies show that if you put a healthy plant-based vegetarian on fish, their cholesterol levels invariably go up, and they can start getting those plaques. Ice cream, 29 milligrams. Butter, just a tablespoon, 31 milligrams. Clams, 57. Crab, 64. And then the egg yolk, 213 milligrams of cholesterol. Now, a lot of people are also confused about this. Notice if you take the chicken breast and scrape the fat and the skin off, it's going to have 73 milligrams of cholesterol. The pork, same three ounce serving, 76 milligrams. Beef, 80 milligrams. And if you don't scrape the fat and the skin off, 82 milligrams for chicken. So fowl is not something that's low in cholesterol. Uh, and the, the media has done a good job of confusing individuals. I've had people come in just for health screenings. They come and find out their cholesterol. They don't go to the, the lecture, and they just try to change things at home, and they come back six months later, and then they're showing me their lab work and saying, Dr. Nedley, what's happened? My cholesterol is very high, and I'm eating all the chicken and turkey I can stand, and it hasn't gone down that much. And in reality, it's not going to go down that much unless we make more dramatic changes. Seafood, a lot of people think that's healthy, but oyster, 84 milligrams, sardines, 120, shrimp, 165. These are high cholesterol foods. And when we get to the organ meats, it's very loaded. Kidney, 365 milligrams. Liver, 410. Caviar, 500 milligrams. And if you ever see anyone feasting on beef brains, 
you have to wonder about their intentions because just one three ounce serving, 1,697 milligrams of cholesterol. Now cholesterol is not only bad because it has cholesterol in it, but it's primarily bad because when we eat it in food, it tends to get oxidized. And when it gets oxidized, it then gets deposited in the arteries. Studies by Bruce Taylor in New York showed this also is true in animals. When animals are fed oxidized cholesterol, rabbits and monkeys will be able to see dramatic vascular damage within 24 hours. It doesn't take long for the damage to be done. Dr. Bruce Taylor also did studies where he fed these monkeys foods and then would actually go in and count the dead cells in their aorta 24 hours later. And the foods that were most damaging, in other words, had the most oxidized cholesterol, uh, we'll show in a minute, but I also wanted to mention this. Pure non-oxidized cholesterol actually doesn't produce vascular damage. So your own liver, of course, we're part of the animal kingdom, we can produce cholesterol. But if our own livers produce cholesterol, which we actually need, we don't need it in our diet, our livers provide all that we need. If we have a lot of antioxidants around, we're not going to need to worry about that cholesterol being oxidized. It's not damaging. Uh, and uh, his studies show if the cholesterol is not at all oxidized, the rabbits and monkeys can eat plenty of it and it not damage them. And that also helps us to realize why uh, infants, some infants, uh, will begin to get those fatty streaks in infancy and other infants will not. It has to do with the infant's diet. And uh, the infants consuming, uh, in fact, I should mention this, the way some mothers eat, the amount of cholesterol in their human breast milk is higher than cow's milk. Which infants do you think begin to get the fatty streaks of infancy? Er, the mother's milk, human breast milk, or cow's milk? Cow's milk. Well, now would that be the case if the cholesterol is lower, at least in some uh, women, when we compare it with some women, it's lower, but you're right. Cow's milk is the one that begins those fatty streaks. The reason has to do with the oxidized cholesterol. The way most infants consume it from their mothers is directly from the nipple, not exposed to the air, not damaging to the arteries. And so the best way for you to drink your cow's milk would be to go down to the barn and get it straight. But Bruce Taylor actually showed, actually we, wouldn't, we don't recommend that either, just so you, uh, you know, that can also produce some issues uh, <laughs> if it's, uh, uh, if it's uh, not sterilized, et cetera, and that'd be a pretty unsterile environment. But Bruce uh, Taylor showed this. The most harmful cholesterol in foods are in custards. Now, what are custards? Milk sugar and eggs. When you mix cholesterol up in a sugar environment and there's plenty of air around as you're mixing it, you're oxidizing that cholesterol. Quite damaging to the arteries. Second most damaging was pancake mix. Now what are pancake mixes made out of primarily? Powdered eggs. You're taking the egg yolk, you're powdering it up, heavily oxidizing it. Third most damaging was Parmesan cheese. Again, powdered cheese, and that was tied with lard. That's not a misprint. They were both tied for number three as being the most damaging cholesterol. And so it's best to get cholesterol out of the diet. Fortunately, you can eat ice creams today that have no cholesterol. If it doesn't have cholesterol, you don't have to worry about the oxidized uh, cholesterol. And there are a lot of options out there, and even in regards to pancake mix, cheese, etc., that are tasty and far uh, healthier for you. The other aspect in regards to avoiding di disease causing foods is the role of nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is the strongest vasodilator in the body and it is actually made by your own cells. It causes blood vessels to enlarge, it prevents blood flow from being sticky or sluggish, it inhibits arterial plaque formation, and if you have high blood cholesterol, it will inhibit the production of nitric oxide, another reason why you want to get your cholesterol down uh, if it's too high. But there's a very simple test called the brachial artery tourniquet test. It actually quantifies the endothelial response. What we do 
is we measure the brachial artery right below the elbow with an ultrasound machine before and after a tourniquet is applied for five minutes. And after that circulation is cut off and the tourniquet is released, the blood vessel will actually enlarge greatly as a result of an outpouring of nitric oxide in response to that to try to get that artery back open again. And we can actually feed you foods and then see what your endothelial response is. It doesn't take long. Just one meal can adversely affect the nitric oxide's ability uh, to be produced and also its ability to actually help the endothelium uh, in those walls to dilate. When volunteers consume cornflakes, their brachial artery tourniquet test is normal. A nice, healthy dilation. If they consume sausage, saturated fat, caffeine, chocolate, sugar, regular olive oil, they fail the test. High fat meals so injure the endothelium that it cannot produce nitric oxide. A lot of people just want to get their triglycerides measured in a fasting level. You actually want to get them measured as well in a postprandial state after a meal. If those triglycerides go up, you're not going to be able to have that nice nitri nitric oxide response. Regular consumption of the toxic Western diet is a cardiovascular disaster, says Caldwell Esselstein from the Cleveland Clinic. And, of course, he's the one that's had over 100 patients with very severe ather atherosclerosis get on his program, and not a single one of them has had a subsequent heart attack or stroke. Uh, as a result of avoiding these disease-producing foods and getting on the foods very high in antioxidants. A low-fat, no-sugar, plant-based diet will cause a healthy dilation of the arteries, especially when the plant foods are higher in arginine. Arginine is an amino acid that gets turned into nitric oxide. Arginine is, is needed to produce it. If the diet, however, is high in meat, dairy, or saturated fat, or if the blood triglyceride level spikes up after a meal, arginine in the diet will not help with nitric oxide production. And so let's take a look at some of the foods with nitric oxide. You might say, well, even uh, since arginine is an amino acid, it's present in animal foods. Cheese has 0.2, egg has 0.2, skim milk has 0.3. But again, these foods are going to, even though they have arginine in it, it's not going to likely produce any significant response as far the, as the vasodilatation. Even beef has some. But a lot of people are unaware that plant foods have a lot more of this amino acid. People think animal foods are higher in amino acids, not the healthy amino acids. Tofu has way more arginine. English walnuts have more. Brazil nuts are a good source. Almonds are a good source. Walnuts are also a good source. And even higher than these nuts per serving are lima beans, uh, 2.4 grams of arginine. Kidney beans, 2.6 grams. Garbanzos, 3.6 grams. Loaded in arginine will help those blood vessels dilate. Lentils, 4.2. Soybeans, 5.3. Pumpkin seeds, 6.2 are the highest. And so uh, it's important to get on those healthy foods while avoiding the disease producing ones. The last aspect, or uh, one of the last aspects in regards to nutrition is uh, being introduced by the World Health Organization that states clearly that premature deaths due to excessive calorie intake are far greater in number than premature deaths due to inadequate calories or nutrients. And so the problem that we have in our Western world is being overweight or obese. And it's very clear by the CDC that if we just take a look at obesity alone, it's the second leading actual cause of death in the United States. And uh, something that we really need to as a nation correct. And getting better health insurance doesn't correct this problem. Uh, it is something that uh, you need to have a role in correcting. And really, it's about calories. Energy intake versus energy expenditure. How would you like to turn 800 calories into 200? Eat a potato instead of a bag of potato chips. Very simple. Leave oily salad dressing off salads. Add a vegan no-oil salad dressing. Eat three oranges instead of four donuts. That's turning 800 calories into 200. 
If you just made one of these changes daily or comparable for six or seven days a week, you would lose approximately one pound per week by just making that simple change. 350 calories for 10 days. One pound of fat is equal to 3,500 calories. That means that if you eat an extra 350 calories of food a day, which is about equal to a large piece of cake or a medium milkshake, you would gain an extra pound every 10 days. Or you would gain a pound in about 20 days if you eat a, or drink an extra 175 calories a day. And so these calories, even though it doesn't seem like a lot, an extra 175 a day or an extra 350 a day, it does significantly add up. And the plant foods are much uh, lower in calories, uh, by and large, particularly the foods that we're recommending, these vegetables and fruits. You can have a huge amount of squash, for instance, for the same amount of calories as one slice of American cheese. Uh, and four and a half little small Kit Kats are equal to 10 tomatoes as far as calories are concerned. And so a lot of people tell me this as patients, Doc, I don't know why I'm gaining much weight because I'm not eating that much. And you know what, in reality, they're not, they're just eating very high caloric dense foods and you don't have to eat a whole lot in order to gain weight on those type of foods. It's uh, actually a lot easier to fill up by eating plant-based foods and it's a lot easier to be on a weight loss program. Well, this is also a new start for the family. What about nutrition for the new mother? Pregnancy complications are less for trim women. Those who take adequate iron, folate, B12, and calcium. Those who avoid infections. And those who have adequate omega-3 intakes. We're recognizing that the baby's health is very crucial in regards to the omega-3 intake, particularly in neurodevelopment of that baby, on how that mother has been consuming omega-3. And omega-3 can actually help bring down those triglyceride levels after a meal as well and help the placental circulation as well as the own mother circulation. These are the top 10 uh, rich foods in omega-3, the plant-based foods where you don't have to worry about the toxic cholesterol. Oregano 10, nine blueberries, sweet red bell pepper eight, avocado seven, pecan six, five green soybeans. Mature soybeans are not so high in omega-3, they're high in omega-6. Wheat germ oil, if you're having white bread, you're not getting the omega-3. But uh, the whole wheat bread does have omega-3. English walnuts are loaded. Chia seeds are even higher yet. And the highest food on the planet, as far as per ounce is concerned, is flaxseed, high in omega-3 and it's a uh, crucial uh, food really uh, in regards to a pregnant uh, woman. Well, I'd like to uh, uh, encourage you in regards to Dennis Diderot, the old French philosopher's proverb who said this, doctors are always working to preserve our health and cooks to destroy it, but the latter are often the more successful. It doesn't have to be that way if we retrain the cooks. And if, if we can actually prepare food that's healthy and tasty, there'd be no reason to go back the other way. It turns out in studies done in America, the average person rotates six entrees per month. That means in 30 days, they will only eat six entrees, but they'll be eating those six entrees repeatedly. They'll go into the same restaurant, order the same menu item off of that restaurant and do so repeatedly. Or they'll have the same entree uh, at home, etc. But the average American doesn't have a lot of variety in their diet as much as they think because they're only rotating six entrees per month. Now if you take a look at the average plant-based eater, they have significantly more variety. Studies show they actually have better taste in their diet than the average meat-eating person. And so they're actually not sacrificing in regards to enjoyment of food, like a lot of people assume. Many people conclude that if it tastes good, it's unhealthy. And that doesn't have to be the case. The, the reason why they think that is that because they equate sugar, sodium, and fat with good taste. 
and uh, we can actually have food that is void of these things that still is actually tasty. Sometimes it gets a little getting used to, uh, but uh, uh, sometimes it actually doesn't uh, require much getting used to, but we can actually change our own taste buds. A plant-based diet can be very tasty and very healthy. Why not learn six great tasty and healthy dishes and rotate them and then learn more from there? All you need to learn is six dishes that are healthy and tasty and you'll have the same variety as what you have in your diet right now. Uh, but it'll be far better. And then once you have that basis of six, you can go on from there. Your health, quality of life, and long-term happiness and longevity are dependent upon what you put into your body. It's very clear. The scientific evidence is firm that, indeed, we need to be analyzing what we're putting into our body, and we need to make changes so that that circulation can actually last for eternity. Thank you very much.